What would you have done if a year ago, someone came up to you and asked you to invest $10,000 with them? In exchange, they would promise you a return of $3.5 million in exactly one year's time. You probably would have done one of two things. A, looked at them as if they had three heads, or if you took them up on the offer and invested $10,000 with that individual, you, my good sir or madam, would have the world's largest set of and you would not need to continue watching this video. But for the rest of us that are still here, and if you're like me and you didn't invest those $10,000, I'm here to say that it's not too late. That investment would have been into a cryptocurrency called Dogecoin, which quite literally is a meme. Now, what's not a meme though are the returns that it generated. In fact, the entire crypto space, it's not uncommon to see 100, 200, 500% returns, which just sounds crazy crazy compared to the traditional equities market. I like money. I like a thousand percent returns. Well, you have come to the right place. In this video, I'm going to give you a breakdown of what exactly is cryptocurrency, some of the arguments for it, as well as against it, and of course, how can you go about from A to Z setting up a brokerage account to start buying and trading your own cryptocurrency? Sound like a plan? All right, then tap that thumb icon to help spread the good word and let's dive in. Before I give you the house to buy cryptocurrency, I should probably give you a bit of a background of what exactly is cryptocurrency. Now, if you're like me, you probably think of Bitcoin when I say cryptocurrency, and you wouldn't be wrong. Bitcoin is actually one of the original cryptocurrencies created in 2009 by a group or a person known as Satoshi Nakamoto. We're not gonna get into the nitty gritty technicals of how Bitcoin works, but I'm gonna explain for you what exactly is the use case and some of the common differences between Bitcoin and the United States dollar. The primary use case for Bitcoin is to act as a store of value. Similarly, how a US dollar is a store of value. Now, there are a number of differences between a Bitcoin and a US dollar. I'll cover the two most common that we see. For example, Bitcoin, has a finite supply, meaning there's only 21 million available Bitcoin in the world. Whereas the US dollar, probably a bit of an infinite supply, considering the fact that we just added 40% to our total money supply in the past year. Another thing to note about Bitcoin is it is not controlled by any one central entity, meaning no one actually controls all of the Bitcoin. I control my Bitcoin, you control your Bitcoin, everyone is in charge of their own Bitcoin. Contrast that to the US dollar or any fiat currency in the world, they are controlled by central banks that can control the supply. In addition, they can control the value to a degree by adjusting interest rates. The value of Bitcoin though, on the other hand, is not dictated by any one central entity. You and I can exchange Bitcoins between our two wallets, meaning you have a wallet that stores your Bitcoin, I have a wallet that stores my Bitcoin, we can exchange them without any sort of intermediary. As opposed to, if I were to send money, say from here, two relatives in China, I would use something like a Western Union or my personal bank to do a wire transfer. Well, in that process, a bank is gonna act as the intermediary to verify that I have funds to send from my bank account to my relative's bank account. In contrast to that with Bitcoin, the network verifies whether or not I have the Bitcoin to send, and they will also verify that the transaction is logged and is added to the destination wallet. In addition to that, transactions settle much more quickly without having to wait the two to three days to settle. When you're using something like the Bitcoin network, it could be done in a matter of minutes. What's also amazing about the Bitcoin network is everything is publicly available, meaning everything is logged and anyone can view it. Wait a minute. But isn't Bitcoin a cryptocurrency? Why is that anyone can view my transactions? See, that's exactly it. It's a cryptocurrency, but it has nothing to do with the fact that people can or cannot view your transactions. The crypto part of cryptocurrency actually comes from how exactly the transaction is processed. Bitcoin is built using blockchain technology. All that means is every single transaction that occurs on the Bitcoin network is packaged up into think of a block. And in order for that block of transactions to be processed, computers have to solve complicated algorithms. And that's where the crypto part comes from. And once they solve an algorithm and get the answer, the computer is then able to add the block of transactions to the longer chain. And in doing so, these computers are rewarded with Bitcoin. You might have heard of the term mining for Bitcoin. Well, that's actually all miners are. Miners are computers that are just helping to solve transactions in order for the Bitcoin network to operate. To put it more briefly, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer digital currency or payment network. 
That's it. Cryptocurrency I must mention, I promise they'll be brief, is Ethereum. The difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin is that Bitcoin acts as a store of value. The primary differentiator with Ethereum is that it is not meant to store value. It's actually meant for developers to join the network and build, say, decentralized applications or smart contracts on top of them with blockchain technology. I know you're probably wondering next, what exactly is a smart contract or a decentralized application? A smart contract simply is a set of code that runs with a certain input and will spit out an output again, without any sort of intermediary. All you need to understand though is Bitcoin is a store of value. Ethereum is a network that you can build applications on top of. All right, why are people so excited about Bitcoin? The first reason and the one that's cited most often has to do with inflation. Inflation simply means a dollar today is worth less tomorrow. Think about it. Back in the 50s, I don't know, hamburger could have been less than 10 cents. How much do you pay for a Big Mac today? And so with Bitcoin though, because there's only 21 million in a finite supply, it's a deflationary asset. As opposed to fiat currency, see the more money that we print, the less valuable it is. And the fact that 40% of the total money supply has been printed in the last year, that's shocking. And so people are flocking to Bitcoin, similarly to the way they might've been flocking to gold as a hedge against inflation. The second reason, Bitcoin is not controlled by any one central entity, meaning you are free to use your Bitcoin how you see fit. No bank can come in and say, no, you can't do that. In addition to that, you're cutting out the middleman and say things like cross-border payments. Instead of now having to go to a Western Union or a bank and paying a wire transfer fee, you're simply just going to exchange Bitcoin for Bitcoin right over the network. Third reason, big players are coming. JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, all the big banks now want a cut of the pie because they realize there's value in Bitcoin. And not only that, they're allowing their ultra high net worth individuals to invest directly into Bitcoin or through funds. The reason why the crypto space is excited about institutional money coming and playing, it obviously helps to smooth out some of the ebb and flow in crypto prices. Fourth, we have an infrastructure bill right now in the United States. And one of the hiccups in this infrastructure bill is how exactly cryptocurrency will be taxed. Now, we're usually not super fond of regulation, but in the crypto space, regulation is actually a good thing. You want laws in place so that you can bring in the big money players, because once the institutional players really come in and play, that is gonna also help skyrocket some of the price of some of these cryptos. In addition, I mentioned earlier, really smooth out some of the ebbs and flows in the price action. On the flip side to that though, let's discuss why people would not invest in cryptocurrency. Earlier I mentioned the ebb and flow. Well, crypto can run up anywhere from 80% and come down as hard as 90% in a given cycle. That is just a crazy amount of volatility to stomach. Two, they make arguments that criminals come in to use Bitcoin. They're not wrong. They do use Bitcoin. They also use cash. The difference between cash and Bitcoin Bitcoin, that ledger is published. Every single person has access to every single Bitcoin transaction since the inception of Bitcoin. Cash on the other hand, well, no one knows. Third, there is no current regulation in place today. And so it's subject to a lot of pump and dump scams. Fourth, your cryptocurrencies are not FDIC insured. In fact, there is no insurance. Therefore, if you lose your crypto, you're scammed out of it, whatever the case may be, I'm sorry, but um, you're SOL. That being said, I've given you pros, I've given you cons. It's up to you to decide of whether or not you want to invest. If you do want to invest, keep sticking around and let's go ahead and talk about how exactly we can go about buying cryptocurrency. First thing you understand, your crypto will be stored in a digital wallet. And when it comes to digital wallets, the main thing you need to understand are there's usually two keys you are given, a public key and a private key. Public key is simply an address that anyone can go and send you crypto. A private key, that's your password. Guard that at all costs and never share it. Because if someone has access to your private key to your digital wallet, they essentially have your wallet. Now it's important to understand that because when it comes to brokerages where you can buy crypto, some of them, you actually don't own the underlying crypto. In fact, you don't actually hold the keys. For example, on Robinhood, Venmo, and PayPal, they actually hold your crypto in custodial wallets. What that simply means is you don't actually own the underlying crypto when you want to transfer it away. So you might buy one Bitcoin, but when you want to take one Bitcoin out of Robinhood, you can't. You cannot transfer it from Robinhood to any wallet. What you would have to do is sell that one Bitcoin, get the US dollar amount or whatever currency amount, and then go and buy crypto somewhere else. 
Compare that to a brokerage like Coinbase or Binance, where you actually have a wallet as well as a public and private key. Meaning, if you bought one Bitcoin on one of those brokerages, you can then transfer and send that Bitcoin to any place else that you want. Most people are saying, if you don't have the keys, you don't have the crypto. For example, what if every single person that owned crypto on Robinhood decided they wanted to cash out? Does Robinhood actually own tens of thousands of Bitcoin? Mm, they may or may not. But on the other hand, if you had a Coinbase or Binance account and you wanted to withdraw your crypto and every single person wanted to withdraw their own crypto, well, it's sitting in their wallet, they have it, they can take it out. For a lot of folks, it might be convenient to do a Robinhood, Venmo, or PayPal. But on the other hand, some folks want complete control to know that they can do whatever it is they want with their crypto without having to sell it. So when it comes to setting up an account, it's actually pretty simple. There's really only two steps required. A third step though, if you're using something like a Coinbase or Binance. So assuming you might be just setting up for Robinhood, go ahead, open the app, register, put in your information, and that's it, you're all set up. Now you're probably gonna have to verify your identification, whether through a driver's license or a passport. Once your ID is verified though, now you wanna set up funding. You can fund directly using a bank account, and in some instances, you might be able to get away with funding using a credit card. The thing that I caution you with when it comes to funding with credit cards, it might code as a cash advance. A cash advance, think of it as a really high interest loan. So if you can avoid that, I'd say generally avoid it. But once your account is funded, now you can go on and the whole crypto universe is at your fingertips. You can buy whatever coins you want. I'd recommend you study up on tokenomics before you just start buying the cheapest thing, hoping for a 10x pump. But that's entirely up to you of how exactly you want to invest in your cryptocurrency. Now, if you set up using something like a Coinbase or Binance, once you've bought your underlying cryptocurrency, let's say one Bitcoin, you can actually take it from that wallet and transfer it to a wallet that might be earning you interest. Something like BlockFi, for example, earns 4% interest on Bitcoin. So you would then transfer it from your wallet in Coinbase over to your wallet in BlockFi and just start earning interest on that. That's what's known as a hot wallet. A cold wallet is just a wallet that's not attached to a brokerage or an exchange. And so some people might just want to have security over their Bitcoin and they might transfer it to a cold wallet that might be just be on a USB stick and they pop it in a drawer or put in a safety deposit box. Because after all, three Bitcoin is equivalent to a Lambo. So you're gonna be wanna be careful in terms of how you're storing and securitizing your cryptocurrencies. I appreciate everyone tuning in. This has been a great video. Please drop a comment in the section below. How do you plan to invest in cryptocurrency? Are you currently investing in cryptocurrencies? What are some of your favorite? Anything we should look out for? As always, it was a pleasure and I hope you took some value out of this video. And if you really did, consider subscribing and giving this a thumbs up. And I will catch y'all next time. Peace.